Good morning, all. We are here today on the 8th of November for our sixth panel on the workshop series, Reimagining Tax Administration, Social Programs Through the Tax Code. And I am Nina Olson, um, the Executive Director of the Center for Taxpayer Rights, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm just gonna frame where this workshop fits within this series. Uh, as you probably know, if you've been following us along, we have had, we've opened the series with learning about the current state of the IRS, how they process returns. We've moved to understanding um, poverty and the various, the characteristics of populations that might be affected by refundable credit programs and other programs to alleviate poverty. We've then moved to a discussion of administrative burden and how that burden affects people who may have those characteristics of the poverty population or the refundable credit population. We then had a session on the eligibility rules for the tax credits, the social programs running through the tax code and comparing them to the programs that are run in uh, by other federal agencies and the eligibility requirements for those folks. And then our last or most recent um, session was a discussion of due process requirements. Um, as the government is administering these programs, what are the essential elements of due process and procedural justice in these programs, particularly as it pertains to populations that have the characteristics that we've been exploring all along? So that brings us to today, which is discussing an issue that keeps coming up in every single one of our workshops, which is culture change. How do you bring about um, the, organ the organization and organizations such as the IRS to embrace the fact that it is administering major social benefits through the code? So before I turn it over to um, Gabriel Zucker from Code for America, I just want to say if you want to put in the chats, you know, chat where you are from, um, that would be great. It's just nice for people to see from all over the place that we've got folks. So then Gabriel, why don't you, our moderator for today, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Nina. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. My name is Gabriel Zucker. I use he, his pronouns. I'm the Associate Policy Director for Tax Benefits at Code for America. I'm really excited to welcome everyone to this conversation. As Nina said, this question of culture kind of has been a through line, I think, of a lot of these workshops. And, you know, as we were discussing some in our prep session for this, it's a bit of a tricky one because culture is both arguably a cause and effect of a lot of the policies we're talking about. So it's both created by a set of policies, um, but then also, uh, you know, the, the existence of uh, existence or lack of existence of a certain culture also creates itself policies and policies just get made based on the culture that exists. Uh, which makes it, you know, a really important but also really tricky thing to explore. Um, you know, how what does it mean to create a culture, and to what degree are we making policy choices that create it, uh, versus creating it so that the, um, other things happen downstream? Um, we don't we don't have any answers on how to disentangle that per se, but we do have a uh, path here to explore it. So we're going to hear first from um, a few different organizations who have, um, to uh, different degrees, managed to center the experience of of the um, people we're trying to serve in the culture of the organization. Uh, we're going to hear uh, we're going to hear from David Weaver about uh, how this was done in the Social Security Administration, uh, from Patrick Heenan about how this was done at the Pennsylvania Health Access Network, and from my colleague Saran about how uh, we think about this at Code for America. And Saran also has the context of um, having been at the IRS before and can make some comparisons about um, how this shakes out. Uh, we're going to hear from Josh uh, at uh, Josh Beck at IRS about uh, some of the considerations about how culture uh, culture change could look at IRS and some, uh, some considerations of what some barriers are in terms of making that change that we'd want to see. And finally, uh, from our fearless leader, Nina Olson, about a proposal, um, a, I believe 12-step proposal uh, for certain ways in which this might be implemented at the IRS. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to David, um, who will talk to us about culture at the Social Security Administration. Okay, well, thank you, Gabriel. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Okay. Well, thank you for uh, having me uh, as part of this panel. I think um, Social Security has a lot to say, uh, partly because it's been in the business of administering uh, social benefits for uh, 85 years now. Um, so before I start, these are just my views. They don't reflect the views of any uh, federal agency or any organization. 
But in this uh, one slide, I'm going to condense 85 his years of history at the Social Security Administration. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background. Uh, so Social Security was maybe the key feature of the New Deal legislation under Franklin Roosevelt. Um, somewhat surprisingly, initially it only covered about half of the U.S. workforce. And even as late as 1950s, uh, the state-run old age assistance programs, these were means-tested programs administered by the states, those were actually bigger than the Social Security program in terms of dollars and uh, number of beneficiaries. Uh, but Congress began an expansion of Social Security in the decades following. Uh, they, they made the program universal, uh, benefits became more generous, and it led to the program we have today, which is nearly a universal program. So if you're working, it's very likely you're in a job covered by Social Security and you pay Social Security taxes. And today, uh, Social Security is the largest domestic program, it pays out about uh, $1.1 trillion in benefits to 64 million, uh, not just retirees, but it's a family benefits program. So it pays benefits to spouses, widows, disabled individuals, and uh, even uh, 4 million child beneficiaries. That happens when a child loses a parent uh, due to death or disability mainly. So that's a high level view of how Social Security came about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the administrative structure of Social Security because I think it's relevant to discussions today. So physically, the Social Security Administration has reach throughout America. It has about 1,200 field offices around the country. Uh, those are currently uh, closed. Uh, they've been closed since March of last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but when they open up again, uh, they serve a staggering number of individuals. So every year, about uh, 43 million individuals will visit a field office. Um, so there's a big physical presence. Uh, but SA also has touch in terms of, it sends out a lot of mail, nearly a million pieces of mail every day. There are about 33 million phone calls to their 1-800 number. And importantly, they also have invested a lot in terms of planning tools for retirees. So retirees can go on the website and figure out what their benefits are, what would happen if they delayed retirement, uh, find out other, about other benefits. And for retirement benefits, they also have a very good um, online application. So one, I'll talk more about IRS le lessons later, but I think uh, one thing is the public's probably used to expecting a variety of service channels, in-person, telephone, and web-based. So I wanna talk a little bit what I, about what I think has worked well at the Social Security Administration and um, uh, pertinent to today's uh, discussion. Part of it is the culture. So staff has, at SSA over a very long history strongly identify with the agency's mission. Um, so if you're a claims rep working in a field office, you see the person who's applying for retirement benefits. You can see the difference the monthly amount's going to make uh, in their lives. You can, you can relate to that person in an important way. Um, also, Social Security uh, is not means tested. So it's a program that's for the very broad part of the American population. And again, I think the uh, workers at Social Security can identify with the clients they serve. They could see themselves in that position or they could see a family member in that position. Uh, another important uh, thing about the culture is SSA has had a history of having executives who believed in the program, um, but this is just as important. They had administrative talent. Uh, so Robert Ball was one of the famous commissioners who um, kind of guided, helped guide the expansion of Social Security, but he also knew how to run a government agency, and he actually gained fame during the Johnson administration for uh, standing up the Medicare program very quickly and successfully. Um, another part, I think, um, in addition to having people who internally bring their views and values to an organization is performance management. So I was at Social Security and the executive board for many years, and executives do pay attention to numerical goals put in their performance plan. So I think that's uh, uh, potentially another uh, important thing to think about. I uh, put up this quote by, this is Bob Ball in the uh, picture of him he, um, in 1962, but this is a quote where he was, uh, a statement he was making to Social Security employees on the 30th anniversary of the Social Security Act in 1965. And when you look at this quote, you can tell somebody who, he believes in the mission of the agency, he sees it doing good in the country, but it's, it's not just that, he's excited about his job and the people at Social Security are excited about their job. Every day they're going in and making a difference in, the pe in people's lives. So. I think this is a good example of the kind of culture um, it would be good for the IRS to emulate as they consider um, administering social benefits. So let me talk about some other things that have worked well at, at Social Security Administration. Um, external relationships. 
Uh, the Social Security Administration has an extensive set of relationships with the advocates. Um, one of the recent ones and kind of exceptional ones is uh, Social Security also administer, administers a program called the Supplemental Security Income or SSI program, and that's a means-tested program for disabled and elderly individuals. Um, there have been some issues in the program in terms, particularly in the COVID-19 environment, a lot of difficulties in administering the program. One of the things Social Security did was it's partnered with the large advocate community on the focus on SSI benefits and in a very formal way. Um, they've completed, they've uh, set up committees and a structure where uh, an executive Social Security administra administration will be paired with an advocate and they work the issues sort of together. So I think this idea of um, being involved with the external community, advocates, um, those who care about the program is very important. Um, SSA actually in the early days particularly had a reputation as being sort of a cutting edge technology agency. So it was one of the first agencies to use uh, uh, the mainframe computers that were coming out of IBM. Um, those were used to kind of calculate benefits. But also even more recently, I think SSA did a good job anticipating uh, that there would be a demand for internet-based services. So its retirement benefits application has proven pretty indispensable in the pandemic environment. Um, when the field offices shut down, uh, there was a web option as well as telephone options. And I think without that, there would have been even more serious problems. Something that's missed a, a little bit, I think, is the, the importance of research and statistics. So I come out of the research and statistics world at Social Security. Uh, but SSA's Office of Research and Statistics goes back to the program's beginning. So you can find articles uh, from this office from the 1940s and so forth. And it's crucial for policymakers to understand how the program's working and how it might need to be changed. And, and that comes about when you have sort of a robust research and statistics environment. And SSA's Office gained fame in a lot of areas. For example, a lot of people know this, but the official poverty line in the US was developed by the Social Security Administration's uh, Office of Research and Statistics. So that's an important um, feature as well as I think what's worked with uh, well with Social Security. So what's worked less well, I think this, these are some things to be mindful of. Uh, budget, um, most policymakers, Social Security is not really a controversial program. And so, uh, but most policymakers sometimes if there's not enough attention, they kind of forget about it. They just assume it works on autopilot. Um, and last year, as you've seen, um, some negative results of that. So SSA's operating budget has been falling while the number of beneficiaries it serves has been growing very fast. So this has created real stress and that stress will show up in the culture. You're gonna have overworked individuals. Uh, they're not gonna bring that kind of positive energy. So budget is something always you have to pay attention to. The other issue is in the budget, there's too much of, in my view, of Social Security's budget going to enforcement. That's the only thing that's been growing in the Social Security budget. Um, so they put more administrative dollars in there to do disability reviews in the hopes of removing some disability beneficiaries from the roles. Um, there's far too great a share of that. The process by which they move, remove disability beneficiaries actually is not a great one. Um, so that's something to guard against a little bit too. Um, a final point is that while there's been a full embrace of the Social Security program, the SSI program, which SSA also runs, is means tested. Maybe a little bit less of an embrace there, and I and I'm actually a fan of the SSI program, and uh, I hope it just does really well. But um, you know, there's this issue about maybe at Social Security that hasn't been as fully embraced. It's a little bit better, perhaps, than when the SSI program first started. But that's something to be mindful of. Um, some other things that haven't worked quite as well: complexity of programs. So as that IRS begins to think about uh, social benefits. Congress can have a tendency to make these more and more complex. They'll try to get some particular group or narrow group or change or tweak the law. Over time, what happens is you get very complex programs. And so for Social Security, it takes maybe up to two years for a claim to represent, represent to be fully proficient because the, the rules are so complex. The complexity of programs has a psychological effect on beneficiaries um, and imposes other costs. So let me point to one example of that. So there's a lot of interest in getting, helping individuals who are disabled if they want to return to work to help them to return to work. So there are a lot of work incentives in the law. And those are, came from a good place, good intention, but there's so many of them and they've been layered so much over time that very few people can even understand or navigate the work incentives and all the rules. So what happens often is that individuals who are disabled and they try to go back to work, they often end up overpaid and then SSA will send them a letter saying, 
uh, you owe the agency $30,000, submit us a check next week. And for a beneficiary who may have a mental impairment or maybe a few financial resources, that's very damaging. So the complexity of a program is kind of a real issue. Um, one area I'd say that SSA on technology needs to uh, think a little bit about, and maybe there's a little too much reliance on social media, which I think has a lot of value, but sometimes it causes people to miss the basics. Sometimes you just need to send somebody a letter explaining what their benefits are, or you need to talk to them over the phone. So there needs to be a variety of outreach channels. And research and statistics has gone well at Social Security. I do think maybe building um, a little more internal capacity would help the agency. So here's how I uh, kind of summarize what I think are some lessons maybe for the IRS when they think about it, uh, getting into more of a role of administering family and social benefits. Um, I think a key is culture plus talent. So it's not just culture, it's culture plus talent. Um, so appoint executives and hire staff who believe in a benefits program. So they believe in it. They think it's important for the country. And also they have a um, demonstrated administrative talent for such programs. Uh, that won't necessarily be from the enforcement side of IRS. So that needs to be thought about and uh, tended to. Um, I would also put numerical goals and performance plans for the executives in terms of program participation. Uh, so to give you an example, um, one of the responsibilities I had at Social Security was overseeing some of the return to work programs. And in my performance plan, there would have been something related to uh, how many people were going to return to work or use the program. That was not directly in my control, but it motivated me to think about how am I gonna make that happen? So put in some numerical goals related to full participation in these social benefits program. I think that helps. I think it also has value of Congress or the executive branch would specifically identify as the mission of either a new part of IRS or as part of the IRS mission that ensuring payments are made because there's always a tendency in government from the inspector general to somebody uh, who's trying to make an issue of it. Don't worry, the people will talk about overpayments. That's going to happen. What people don't talk about is underpayments or mispayments. And it would help if you had the blessing of Congress or the executive branch specifically saying our core mission is to make sure the benefit payments are made. I would give people service options, particularly as you get into things about advanced credits where it's happening uh, before tax season, or maybe people who aren't even uh, filing taxes or normally wouldn't. And people send, tend to prefer service options, so field, phone, web-based. Uh, SSA actually does have a field structure already, and so maybe it makes sense for IRS to partner with them a little bit. And that happens in the government. So for example, the USDA uh, partners with SSA um, and reimburses them for taking um, SNAP applications in the field offices. So maybe think about government as a whole here when you think about sort of the field structure. Um, I think establishing relationships with the advocate community has worked well at us saying is a good thing uh, for IRS. Um, and don't forget about research and statistics. That's one thing that kind of gets left behind. But if you can document that the program's working well or where it's not working well, you'll get a lot more attention from policymakers, I view, I think. Um, and there are policy trade offs um, involved here, but simpler programs, maybe to broader populations, have advantages. Um, but I realize they're trade-offs and means-tested programs can have a good place and I'm, I, I think there's a role for them. But just be aware that when you have programs that have a level of complexity uh, or sort of um, very narrow populations, that, that, that perhaps requires a little more attention. Uh, so Gabriel, those are a few thoughts I had on uh, sort of lessons learned um, uh, that I think would help uh, IRS a little bit. Thank you so much, David. Um, I have the simple job here and I still forgot to do one of the key aspects of it, which was to introduce uh, who uh, David even is before he began speaking. So I will provide a post speaking yeah. intro and then I will uh, move us to the next speaker. Um, David, who you're hearing from, was uh, served at Social Security for more than 20 years, most recently as Associate Commissioner for Research, Demonstration, and Employment Support. Uh, he finished his federal career at the Congressional Budget Office, where he was Director for Health Retirement and Long Term Analysis. Um, Thanks so much, David, for those uh, really valuable thoughts. I'm going to turn us next to Patrick Keenan, who's the Director of Consumer Protections and Policy for the Pennsylvania Health Access Network. He leads FAN's campaign to lower prescription drug prices. He built FAN's statewide consumer engagement program that enrolls thousands healthcare and works to resolve nearly 20,000 consumer issues a year and empowers consumers with information and resources from disconnected and rural communities. Um, Patrick, take it away. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. So, you know, we have a little bit of a different perspective, but I think it's relevant to what this group is talking about. Um, we were one of the first navigators in Pennsylvania when the Affordable Care Act was passed and this new in-person assistance program was kind of created by the Affordable Care Act. So I wanna share a little bit of lessons from our statewide program. I hope everyone can see the slides correctly. Okay, great. So the first thing I think that's really important just as a bit of background is to kind of talk about what a navigator is. Uh, some may have a very vague um, and unclear idea you may have seen uh, kind of, you know, these signs in strip malls or, you know, in, in, in lots of different communities where you can't quite tell what's going on there, but there's lots of mentions of Obamacare. Or you might think about someone standing behind a table, you know, at, a, at an event, whether it's a health fair or some kind of other public outreach. But beyond that, you might not know much more about what a navigator does. Um, when, in fact, I think it's really important to think about the human element. And I think a lot of the things that we're going to say today echo what David uh, has already shared with us at the Social Security Administration. So this is really about relationships and helping people navigate a really complex thing that involves both their healthcare and their taxes and some other aspects uh, of their, you know, the moving pieces of their life. Uh, to do it in a really person-centered way that's direct, engaging, and in kind of the middle of, you know, the messiness of life. I like the picture that kind of shows, uh, you know, before having kids myself, I always wondered, you know, like, why do people bring their kids, you know, to enrollment? You know, can't they find childcare? Well, it is very messy, right? And, and you know, people are making these kinds of decisions in the community and, and need to have their children with them. So it's the messiness of life. Um, as I Google searched through these pictures, uh, I was excited that, you know, one of ours kind of comes up in the lower right hand corner that I, I outlined there, but it really is about putting people together with people applying for benefits and, and navigating the messiness. A little bit about our work. So uh, we had about six or seven navigators to cover the state of Pennsylvania. We intensely covered about 26 counties, um, meaning that we ultimately reached about 100,000 people a year, taking 10,000 calls. Uh, you can see we had about 1,500 enrollments. So that really gives you a good sense of kind of what it takes to really engage with people. There's, you know, diminishment is, you know, from the people that you connect with to the people that you answer questions for to the people that actually enroll. But our success really came from a network of community-based relationships and partners that ultimately led to word of mouth um, kind, kind of engagement. We saw ourselves as different because we developed a 365 day follow up process. So for those applying for the Affordable Care Act, it wasn't enough to kind of guide them through the initial follow up process. It was really important to stay connected with them to help them navigate how their life changed throughout the year and ultimately to get them to re enrollment. We really think about this model as not just community based, but community competent. Um, one of the things that we did is we eliminated offices well before the pandemic and kind of switched to a virtual work environment because it allowed our staff to be present in local communities. So there's really two insights that I want to talk about here. One is on the staffing side and the other is on the systems and program side to kind of support individuals um, in, in these complex situations. The first thing that I really have to say about navigators, some people think about them as, you know, maybe uh, paraprofessionals or folks that, you know, just have to have enough knowledge of the community or maybe they're from the community and that's all they really need and then they can kind of make magic happen. There is an element of truth there, but it's also really important to ensure that they're highly trained, they're professionalized, they're not just thought as add-ons, but that they're really a part of a system and that they have the comprehensive knowledge that allows them to deal with the complexities of working with vulnerable people uh, that have um, really complex and unusual circumstances. I think the first thing I want to say overall is expect the unexpected. That becomes a cliche, but really when you're kind of dealing with individuals, uh, there is no textbook case. Everyone's circumstances are, are slightly unusual and people have to be prepared to deal with that. But also, you know, if you do all of this great staffing, one of the things that was lacked in the Affordable Care Act was, was a way to really support them in a way that expands access and ease of applications and in a way that quickly resolves complex situations. So this is a second core part that we'll get into. Um, as I mentioned, my background, obviously, I read a lot of children's books. So for those of you that have uh, small children in your life, you may 
know the caps for sale book, but um, you know, let let everyone wear these hats. Um, people are ultimately trusting other people in vulnerable communities, not the system themselves. Many of the folks that we were reaching out to had a bias against the system, and they weren't, you know, looking to be connected to the system. So it really was about building those relationships. Uh, we really, I already touched on this, but it was so important to have experts and folks that had comprehensive knowledge sets that could quickly and um, and in the moment react to individual situations rather than kind of waiting to kind of get an answer from someone else. Um, it, it really, people um, often, you know, that you connect with out in the community may not be back around in a couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks while someone finds the answer uh, that they need. So it was really important to put people um, that were equipped to kind of deal with that messiness. Uh, resource and pay considerations, obviously with, with building a program up, you know, the, the program wanted to reach the greatest number of folks and, and um, kind of often at the kind of least expense and kind of a competitive process. But but we found that, you know, by increasing uh, the compensation of our navigators and making sure that they had the resources that they needed, including travel to cover a very large area, um, that that ultimately resulted um, in, in quality over quantity. And, and ultimately, we got the quantity as well. I think that, you know, thinking about some of these um, outreach strategies really is providing some form of intensive case management and no offense to any social workers who are on the call, but really, I mean, it, it has to dig deep, deeper than just the surface, and people have to be resourced with the technology and the ability to conduct follow-up with individuals on the ground. Um, and the last thing to David's point, David highlighted how SSA has really uh, connected with advocates, creating a feedback loop of those close to the ground, not just the advocates, because I mean, coming from the advocacy community is one thing, but also then having navigators that are on the ground interacting with folks is a totally different experience and takes the advocacy to a different level. But uh, unfortunately, often we were struggling to create the feedback loop ourselves among other navigators to push things up uh, to folks in, in, in CMS and SOSIO, which they were very receptive to, but that natural channel didn't exist. So, um, it, you do, why do you need these people that are so well trained? Well, you know, it gets messy quickly. Um, you know, ultimately the ACA and its training really focused in on the first part of this, the eligibility, which was really determining household size income and, and understanding the basics of a tax return. But I think we need to think about all of that in a broader frame. Um, what makes that messy? Well, you know, in a, in a program like the Affordable Care Act, where you have to use your current income and not your previous year's tax returns, but what you expect to file in the next year's tax returns, you really have to think about, you know, what people plan, what then happens to them, and what ultimately they report when they file those federal income tax returns. It's a level of complexity that is very hard for the average individual to navigate, and, and frankly, difficult for the navigators themselves, but really important when thinking about programs like the child tax credit. Um, it's also complicated by our reality and our papers not often matching. So, you know, what was actually happening versus what is said in papers is something that's it's a very tricky thing for navigators to figure out, for people to figure out, and you know, we kind of have to think about all of that. The last thing is, um, you know, wait, there's more. You know, we have um, all of that complexity layered within a world of perceptions, real world consequences, lots of misinformation. I don't think that anyone that's been alive over the past you know, decade and talk, heard of the Affordable Care Act discussed on the news needs anything uh, more of an explainer than that. Um, but also, you know, all of this is, is interconnected to these life changes. Um, gaining a kid, losing a kid, kid, kid aging out, income changes, who's claiming a kid. Um, I think you can kind of think about how this would apply. Um, but the navigators have to, you know, navigate this. And I think in that word cloud over there really is a, a messy situation. People have very negative reactions when you think about the IRS. Uh, you know, it, it quickly evokes, you know, Big Brother or a gotcha or a trap, um, you know, but for other folks, it could mean, uh, you know, that there's confusion about the rules or there's concerns about deportation or, you know, uh, uh, detention, incarceration, um, you know, for returning citizens. So it, it is very messy work. And that's another reason why we need people so trained in all of this. 
Um, relevant to kind of thinking about this in-person assistance out in the community um, is kind of a, you know, take what comes your way. And so it could be, you know, someone at the initial enrollment, uh, but it could also be, you know, someone that's needing to report life changes where you're reacting to the enrollment. Uh, it could be about, you know, tax filing time. So often what the navigator had said or the life changes that have been reported had to be reported to a tax filing professional that would ultimately muddy the water or contribute to misinformation or just confuse things even more so that when someone came back to re-enrollment, um, you know, they, they weren't fully prepared or they had new problems that had emerged because of other people being involved in that process. Uh, so that's another nuance as to why um, you need someone that's really good. And I'm gonna back up because I think we skipped over a slide here. Um, the ACA incorrectly made a distinction between outreach and enrollment education and po post enrollment support. Um, ultimately, they thought about navigators being those people that were kind of like the ACA cheerleaders in the community helping people signed up. Um, but then they had uh, thought about consumer assistance programs or some kind of other level of support that would deal with everything post enrollment. Ultimately, most of that came to the insurance companies, which are probably the least uh, equipped to kind of, you know, explain to someone all of this, because obviously they want to, you know, keep their existing book of business. But, you know, when talking about whether it's a marketplace plan or Medicaid, it's really important to have someone that can be there the whole time. Ultimately, what I think is very interesting and analogous to what you all are considering is it's all about the taxes. So, you know, on the enrollment side, we needed to calculate income and household size and really understand the tax forms at a deep level to not just look at adjusted gross income, but the ACA made modifications. So we had to be trained to, to figure out what that modified income was. Um, but then ultimately to remain eligible, you had to file taxes and reconcile your credits. And then the eligibility changed depending on what you filed. And people often didn't remember what they had done over a year earlier when they were signing up for coverage. Uh, so it really seg segmentation and fragmentation hurt the process. Uh, that's why we created the 365 day follow up process to really try to keep engaged with folks throughout the process. So moving back to where we are, pivoting from the people side to the program side. This idea of community focused design. I don't know if this exists anywhere in the literature. I'm not here to this isn't an actual theory. This is just my musings here. But but really we had a hub and spoke model where people were based maybe in one county but covered four surrounding counties uh, through that network of, of community based sites. Um, often, you know, meeting people in non traditional situations. If you're if you're to maximize enrollment, it's not going to be done between nine and five because most of the folks who are coming to us were very busy between you know, the hours of maybe 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., which meant sometimes our navigators were you know, dealing with folks at 11 o'clock at night if they were really looking to kind of reach the, the hardest to reach. Often we set up a system where we traveled to the people rather than having people travel to us. It takes a lot of time. People are not ready to just show up on your doorstep just because you hang a shingle out. And so, you know, thinking about how long, you know, focusing in on how long it takes to reach communities, particularly the hardest to reach um, is important. And most of what we did was about connecting with those that are not already connected into programs. So one of our, our sister navigator programs focused in on community health centers absolutely crucial and important, a great site for folks that were already connected and getting their health care from community health centers. But we were focusing in on the folks that weren't already connected or weren't willing to go to a health center or were ambivalent or, or nervous about doing so. Um, probably the most important lesson uh, to kind of think about is, as, as you design a program is to make sure that there's a backdoor um, and, and a backdoor in multiple ways. First of all, the ACA had great legislative language around no wrong door and the healthcare handshake. It was all a fallacy. There were many wrong doors that you could actually go through when you're applying, some that were uh, quicker than others. And it really took a navigator to kind of tell people, you know, how uh, applying in a certain way might affect their, the time in which they get coverage versus another. Um, data systems, you know, we, so much of what the ACA did relied on as much real-time data as possible, but then the states had to implement that. Data systems fail people all the time. So you need those people on the ground to kind of like help figure out those hard to serve cases. 
I think I've said this multiple times, but very few people have normal lives or regular problems. Uh, they're coming to you because they have irregular lives and irregular problems. Um, you know, it, again, I can't say it enough, expect the unexpected. Um, a call center, you know, part of what everyone always thought was a good call center was going to fix everything. Um, but unfortunately, often a call center was more of a barrier because we didn't have this back door. We had to continue to go through the front door and push through a call center that wasn't equipped to deal with the messiness of things. Um, and ultimately, connecting the navigators with the right tools to do their job, escalate and track problems, and communicate with those who can resolve problems is probably the most important design element I would emphasize for folks. It's something we finally accomplished in Pennsylvania when we created a state-based exchange, but it was really hard for the federally facilitated marketplace to do. So here are my final thoughts. Um, one thing was that, you know, navigator programs often kind of thought some uh, that were less successful thought about hiring a lot of seasonal or part-time employees. This is about year-round work. Remember, it takes time and trust to build relationships with people. Uh, the infrastructure also takes time. So for an organization like ours, um, where we had to kind of support the staff on the ground, you know, a yearly grant cycle was was very difficult. That was something that um, that uh, the current or the, the previous administration now had um, had thought about as just kind of these yearly proposals, whereas a three-year grant cycle under uh, in certain circumstances was much better. Um, again, this is about community-based work, so I would really be skeptical in a good way of big corporations that may have you know fancy call centers or value adds or talking about scale. Um, but often they didn't have the, um, they had too much rigidness and overhead to really facilitate on the ground connections. Thinking about uh, what the, the ACA did, um, there was a, a, a similar role for agents and brokers to navigators, often that was somewhat privileged um, as part of the equation. But remember, you know, you really have to think about who are the folks, navigators had a unique responsibility to put consumer interests first. And so if there's any subcontractors or, you know, thinking about tax preparers that might not be community based, um, you know, it's really important to kind of think about that. And I have to end with thinking about that feedback loop again. Um, it was something that outside nonprofits like uh, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Community Catalyst, uh, other groups had kind of pulled together uh, along with the Kaiser Family Foundation, some informal feedback loops or some were more formalized. Um, after some time, but it really um, ultimately almost added another layer because they were ultimately, the advocates were ultimately dealing with CMS and Sasayo. So um, I really think that in any program that's directly serving folks, getting as close to the ground as quickly as possible with highly trained individuals is critical and probably the thing that would ensure success the most. So I'm really grateful for the time to present this and, and happy um, at any point to answer any questions folks have. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, before I turn this to Saran, I want to actually pose a question back to David and Patrick based on a couple of things that came up and also based on Emma's question in the chat. Um, as as far as how culture interacts a lot in building presentations with with uh, folks representing the agency or, or representing, if not the agency, you know, an organization enrolling folks, um, people who are actually interacting at the ground level with beneficiaries, the, you know, I think it's clear intuitively and clear from presentations. That's a big part of what creates the perception of the culture um, that the beneficiaries experience. Um, David, you picked up on something about uh, the degree to which you know those agents, the the the, the, the people who are in the agency, feel they can identify with the beneficiaries, and that being an important part of the connection. Um, and Patrick, you picked up a lot on the importance of them having really specialized knowledge to you know to the kinds of really detailed things that might come up. Um, and I'm curious to both of you, like these, in a certain sense, being potentially two sides of the same coin, but maybe also a little bit um, two different priorities. What's the importance in terms of creating culture of uh, of these people, of the folks who are you know interacting with beneficiaries, having really really specialized knowledge versus sort of just being there as a friendly face who can say that they understand where you know where people are coming from and identify with their struggles. And especially, I'll, my add on to that is how does that interact with the ability of you know, people who are navigators to serve folks in access in different programs. 
Um, do they need this really specialized knowledge in each one, which might uh, you know, prevent them from being a little bit cross-functional? Or is it a lot more about this, this nature of the type of interaction and, you know, and, and being able to just help navigate and guide them even if they don't have every detail? Um, I know this might be a bit of a false choice, but I'm curious of where you uh, might both stand on that, uh, that, on that dichotomy. Maybe uh, Patrick, we'll start with you on that, if you have any thoughts. Sure. So I hate to be the, the cop out, but I mean, it really is both, um, you know, and, and I think that putting it in perspective over time, we've worked with, you know, our partners like community legal services to really add in um, the ability for our navigators to be cross trained in benefits and to be able to do, you know, other things like SNAP and LIHEAP applications, uh, help people you know, help kind of uh, identify folks that might need help uh, on SSI and get them connected over to community legal services and, and other help agencies. So I think it's really critical, but, but without, I mean, I think without equipping them with that knowledge and making them feel important, it's not enough to have a smiling face where you empathize with folks because ultimately the application process is so precise. Eligibility means something and going back to that slide of that messiness of how people's lives interact, you could have a tremendous amount of empathy and really want to be able to help folks. But what we found is for, for some folks when they didn't get high quality help from really well-trained folks, that's what added to the messiness. And ultimately it, it could even disconnect them further from the system because they had someone who was well-intentioned and wanted to just get them connected to coverage. And then ultimately they got a large bill because they had to pay back their advanced premium tax credit in the end because you know someone said oh don't worry about it you know this is this is what it actually is but they weren't taking the time to really kind of break it down understand that person's situation and and um and figure it out with them so i do think it's both because you know you have to go i i think that smiling face and someone who is empathetic was kind of the initial intent behind the navigator program um, but that's, I think, you know, moving beyond just that. You still need that as a core requisite for anyone who is a navigator. No one would be fit uh, to be in our program if they didn't have that at the beginning. But really building them up from that point really helped make, uh, make it excellent and make outreach even more effective. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, I'll toss it to David for your thoughts on the same question. Sure, I think uh, you know, I think that's a really good point. I think one way you can bridge this idea of people being very good at their jobs, having command of the detail, but also being encouraging and so forth. And this is an important uh, point for IRS. You can do that through the training of employees. So for example, um, in the old days, particularly at Social Security, when they would train a new claims representative, they would not only train the claims reps in the, the details of benefit calculation, eligibility and so forth, but they would take time to train the person in the principles of the program, what the program was trying to achieve. And so the person who was then interacting with the public not only had technical command, but they could relate to the person in a way because they understood why this program exists or what it's trying to do. So I think um, uh, there's some real opportunities there. And it's something to be mindful of because I think nowadays, uh, a lot of the training in federal agencies is just done. Um, maybe they'll release a video or something and somebody can follow it. Um, but there needs to be kind of an investment in training, not just to have command of the details, um, but that you understand what is the program trying to do? And then I think the, the employee can relate to the people who are seeking benefits and understand the program is. Um, the other thing, um, uh, the idea of a smiling face or a warm person interacting, um, I think that can be important uh, depending on the program or the, the benefit you're administering. So for example, I definitely heard stories from claims reps who would say, uh, for example, under Social Security, you can um, you can file benefits as a divorced spouse. But you would hear stories from the field that some people would be reluctant to talk about their divorce or what happened or anything like that. And so there, I think the role of an empathetic or a warm or an engaging person does have value. Um, so um, again, you have to train people in the details of the program, the principles of the program, but also you have to have people who can uh, work with the public and understand uh, when they're gonna be nervous about talking, talk about things or reveal things. I think that would be kind of an ideal play in my view. Thanks for that. Um, I think I'll uh, move us along for now, just being conscious of time, uh, but we can come back to these uh, sticky questions later in the conversation. Um, 
next up we have uh, we have Saran De Silva. Uh, Saran is a principal product designer uh, at Code for America. Um, in his role, he's imagining reimagining government services by creating innovative, data-driven, human-centered designs. Uh, he's been a user experience advocate in federal, nonprofit, and commercial markets. Previously, he worked at the IRS, where he oversaw a cross-functional team to create and implement a consistent digital IRS brand. Uh, Saran, take it away. Great. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen okay? Great. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Saran Silva. I'm a principal product designer at Code for America. Uh, we're a nonprofit based out of San Francisco. And here, um, I live in uh, outside of the DC metro area. I'm working on tax benefit applications geared towards helping individuals and families receive the tax benefits they're owed. Um, prior to joining CFA, I, I worked at the IRS within their online services division. And there I helped to improve uh, the overall experience with a number of digital products to help navigate the complicated tax system. Uh, so I was delighted to hear about this workshop and how we're looking at IRS structure, um, having worked both inside the IRS and now outside of the agency um, and leading similar efforts uh, around digital products and building those digital products. I want to offer my perspective and share what I've learned about each organization's approach to digital service delivery. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go over um, how Code for America organizes or structures itself around a goal and then works through a process to develop a digital service. And then after seeing the Code for America approach, um, I could talk about what the IRS is facing and what areas uh, could be improved. So um, a little bit about Code for America and the mission we organize around. Um, we believe in the possibility of creating a people-centered government. And that means we're focusing on the, the people that use our systems at first and trying to uh, best understand their needs, their, their motivations and hurdles that they might face. Um, Patrick was kind of talking about this a little bit, about actually meeting the people where they are and just understanding what they were going through. We've seen those pictures of people bringing in um, children to like um, offices and just trying to make sure that we're understanding what, what their hurdles are. And once you design uh, that system, uh, or once you know what, what's there, you can build those equitable systems. Um, you can design services um, that are more for people on every path as opposed to just the happy path. Um, the happy path is where everyone that interacts with your system is exactly what they need and knows what to do um, uh, when interacting with your, your whatever your application. Um, we need our digital services to also serve people that might have more difficulty using our services. Um, for our tax benefits team, this can take the form of designing digital products to accommodate individuals that might not have their W-2s or not know how to get the tax credits they typically um, they would typically get because they don't have filing requirements and they don't know actually how to file tax returns. Or they might be struggling with outdated uh, digital websites because um, those websites might not be mobile friendly and uh, their phone is the only way that uh, they can go online. So as we build out these services, um, we take what we learn from those data points um, and inform others what we can do to build a better uh, government. And we do that through every aspect of organization, um, always trying to find ways to improve continuously. Um, so centered around that mission, we try to build better services by bringing together cross-disciplinary teams um, that can operate effectively together. Um, here you can see how our tax benefits team is structured. Uh, we have a program team that deals with both the, the policy and building partnerships with government agencies and community-based organizations and other partners. Um, our user research team works to understand the, the problems that clients are facing. And then gathering that policy uh, information and the client information that we're learning, it gives us a broader understanding of what we can do to build a more equitable system, understanding where those gaps are. Um, we take that knowledge and our product management uh, team then guides the development of our digital service. Um, our design, product design and engineers work closely together to develop the application. Um, and then after that application is la launched or product is launched, our client success teams works with the individuals using our products um, to find ways to improve and understand the, the issues that they might face as they're going through um, working with the product. And then our data scientists um, look at the quantitative data um, to identify uh, trends and spot improvements um, we can make to the application. Um, now, our team is relatively small, especially compared to the product teams that I work with at the IRS. And a benefit of having a small cross-functional team 
is that we can regularly have interactions across disciplines. Um, therefore, information about policy, for example, is reaching engineers working on developing the application. And client success call information is provided to the product designers to, uh, to make improvements to, to the flow. Um, and these interactions allow everyone on the team to be more knowledgeable about the, the full tax benefit experience when creating these digital services and just being on the same page. Um, and so with this team, we're able to launch a digital product, getctc.org, to help people receive their child tax credit. Um, we worked in collaboration with the White House and Treasury to bring the service forward. And what's amazing to me is how quickly this team was able to put the product together. Um, we were able to go from concept to launch in about five months. And that included an incredible amount of work from our product and engineering teams to become IRS certified e-filers during that same span of time. Um, and this digital service we provided levels the playing field uh, and makes things more equitable. We listen to individuals that would be using the application to understand their needs and any hurdles they face. And we made, and as such, we made sure that um, the, the product itself was mobile friendly and available in both Spanish and English. And happy to say that it's been used to file over um, 100,000 accepted returns at this time. And so seeing how uh, Code for America operates. I can look back at my time at the IRS, and um, sometimes when describing my life at the IRS, I feel like my coworkers, most of whom are headquartered in San Francisco, which is Tech Board, imagine a picture like this. Um, I'm happy to say that this picture is old, and we do have computers on our desk now, uh, or we did when I was working at the IRS. But uh, a quick note on this picture, um, shortly after it was taken in 1966, the IRS piloted a toll-free telephone network system, which eventually allowed the IRS to handle most taxpayer inquiries by phone. Um, and you can think of this as like an early dipping of the toe for the agency into providing digital um, or analog customer service. Um, but as I mentioned, I was worked uh, in, in line, um, online services within the IRS. An organization was focused on improving the digital services of the agency. Uh, within online services, I was part of a uh, newly formed user experience and division uh, design branch. Um, and I worked with uh, my co fellow coworkers at the IRS and we knew the, the immense job we were facing. Um, as Patrick mentioned before, when people think of taxes, they think of like a complicated forms and difficult to navigate information. And I believe most of our team was drawn to that challenge by, um, by ch trying to change those perceptions of what, um, what the tax experience is like and trying to improve it. Um, and I'm happy to say that I started, as the time we started, we were able to develop more influence within the organization, partly because of a, a larger government-wide focus on customer experience, but also because, um, because of the improvements we were able to make within digital services and the general user experience. And I think that was shown across, or a lot of the, the organization was able to see those improvements that we were able to um, uh, uh, add in. Um, but there was a lot of work to be done. And um, the staffing at the IRS uh, did not match that, the amount of the work that we were facing. Um, on the left, you can see, there's two graphs here on the left, see a graph that shows the amount of revenue being collected by the agency over the last decade. And on the right, it shows how staffing at the agency fell during around that same time. Um, my teammates and I were constantly wearing multiple hats to accomplish our mission. Um, and our group of user experience specialists were focused more on just, than just improving the user experience. We were developing systems and even handling procurement of digital tools and design software for our entire organization. And when you have uh, individuals that are focused outside of their, their typical focus area, um, they start taking on additional responsibility and then they lose their that core focus and they're not able to effectively achieve that mission. Um, it just becomes too much work to handle. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the current IRS landscape um, and what you might be, uh, what might be affecting the, the current state of digital services there. Um, so first there's, there's these established processes as with any government agency, there will be a number of rules and regulations that you must follow. And for the most part, these regulations are put into place uh, with good intention. It's just that sometimes these processes slow down the time that it takes to build out these digital services. Uh, for example, before uh, any type of user research starts at the IRS, you would need to submit a, um, a privacy and civil liberty uh, impact assessment, also known as a, a PCLIA. And in that, you have to state all the questions that you'll be asking all your research participants, um, and that assessment needs to be reviewed 
um, by another part of the agency. And now this is good because it mitigates risk from collecting any uh, personally identifiable information from people and ensures all the necessary guidelines are followed. But the issue is that this drags out timelines when doing research and design sprints. And because of these back and forth approvals, um, you typically have to wait, uh, you'd have to submit a list of questions and um, that you want to ask taxpayers and then have to wait weeks or months before uh, we began that research study. And by, by that time, taxpayer mindsets can shift and the questions can become outdated. So you're just dealing with a, um, a longer lead time before you, anything of, any one of those things gets done. Um, the agency is consciously risk averse. Um, one of the things that struck me after I joined, what, uh, joined Code for America was the tenacity we had as an organization. We had big ideas like launching a new product and becoming an e-filer in a few months. Um, when I first joined the team, um, they had just built a custom uh, customer relationship management system to handle its, all its work that uh, they were doing with Vita partners. And I think you'll find that the IRS is much more risk averse um, and rightfully so to a degree, they're dealing with a lot of sensitive information and we as taxpayers want the IRS to be cautious and deliberate in making changes. Um, but I believe that that attitude permeates the organization and causes the agency to be more hesitant to take calculated risks and therefore reluctant to, to improve the user experience. Um, they're, they're more focused on fraud. Um, it's easy to hate on the IRS. Um, a story about losing money or refunds going to the wrong individuals would make more headlines than any story about improving customer service. Um, our, our experience branch was always trying to push for a more equitable system, but we would always face pushback and the agency seemed to be more interested in making sure products were secure at the expense of customer experience. Um, therefore, services would become harder for people to verify their identity, say, or without specific information or documents that they might have. Um, and so if you're not on that happy path where you have all the information that you need, you'd find it harder to be able to uh, log in and access those digital services that the IRS provided. Um, and then there's a, there were a lot of outdated tools and equipment. Part of the, 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 this deal with security is that we didn't have the best tools to do our work to create modern digital services. Uh, I mentioned prior how we were we were left to secure design tools and software that we needed. And we also found it was just hard to get those latest tools and software because it was either a lack of funding to purchase them or just security restrictions in place that wouldn't allow us to mo use most web applications and tools or software on the, the IRS service itself. Um, there was it was pretty locked down and most most applications weren't accessible. Um, and even those that were didn't have the full feature set that we would need to to be able to make these modern tools or modern modern digital services. Um, but as I mentioned before, there is more of a focus on customer service across the federal government. Um, and some recent legislation is emphasizing that even more. Um, one of the things that helped us when we were dealing with the reluctance to change within the organization um, was the, the ability to point to different types of legislation that mandated that we improve. Um, and I'll talk about two of these. First is the, the Taxpayer First Acts, which we've been discussing here. Um, here, it's a way to enhance the way the agency is serving taxpayers, and that's looking through at the taxpayer experience strategy and then also the training strategy, and then, um, then also looking at um, an organizational redesign. Uh, the second one is the 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act, or 21C IDEA. Uh, this piece of legislation uh, seeks to modernize federal websites um, all across uh, the government and um, digitize services and forms and be accelerate the use of e-signatures to improve the customer experience. Um, this second uh, 21C idea was big within the agency, at least for our digital product standpoint, because it, it mandated that we were taking a customer experience approach to any of the products that we were uh, releasing. And that really um, that resonated well with the, everything that we were doing and making sure that we were reaching out to taxpayers to understand that their needs. Um, but together, these two pieces of legislation, in, in addition to others that have passed recently, has helped to try and get us to more of that people centered government, which um, we're all trying to, to reach. And that's all. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate having the opportunity to speak on this. Thanks so much, Duran. Um, 
I think let's let's keep this uh, moving on. I'll turn this over to Josh Beck, uh, who will speak a bit more about the current uh, landscape within the IRS and the implications of that for uh, for culture. Uh, Josh is a senior tax analyst in the Taxpayer Advocate Service Attorney Advisor Group. Uh, Josh, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for um, having me here and um, been very interesting discussion. And I hope that I can build on that. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in any one of these areas specifically, but I've been at the IRS, IRS for some time now, and I've seen um, changes occur. I've seen, you know, new legislation and how that's been implemented, big initiatives. And I will say that, uh, you know, so often the IRS is putting its best foot forward to make change and serve taxpayers. But change, especially as an institution like the IRS often moves at a glacial pace. And it's, you know, something that happens in increments and, you know, not big leaps necessarily. But we'll go through these slides and just kind of have a discussion about this. And my first slide here where we're talking about the evolution of the IRS. And I added this in here because when I started thinking about this presentation, I started, I was thinking about culture and culture made me think about anthropologists and anthropologists look at how civiliz civilizations survived and how they adapted and adjusted their behavior to changing circumstances around them. And, you know, I think this sort of sets out at a very high level, the evolution of the IRS and where it's been and how maybe we've slowly gotten to where the IRS is today. And as you can see in retrospect, at least at the time, maybe it didn't feel this way, but in retrospect, this was a very small, you know, there's a small bureau, a very specific task that was assigned to them. Um, over the years that became more modernized as automation came about. Um, although I'm sad to say that some of the systems that we adopted in the future aren't, um, or in the 50s, um, you know, are almost equally as old as that, at least going back to the Kennedy administration in some cases. Um, and then in the 80s thereafter, you really see somewhat of a shift with the enactment of legislation that's focusing on more social programs, such as the earned income tax credit, you know, um, child tax credit and, you know, as the education credits deductions and just using the tax code in a different way to try to drive, address different social wel welfare issues. You know, in the great recession, we had um, economic stimulus payments. We had the first time home buyers credit, um, getting healthcare to people as was mentioned earlier, um, the advanced premium tax credit. And of course, most recently, all the, uh, initiatives to support taxpayers, to support citizens as um, we deal, struggle with COVID through the economic impact payments, the advanced child tax credit, um, and other credits such as the employee, um, employee retention credit. So let's go to the next slide and look at the mission statement, because now I think we've looked at a little bit of like where the IRS came from, you know, how it evolved, but where are we at? And I sort of think of this as like a you know, going, moving it from the shoes of an anthropologist to the shoes of a sociologist, where we're currently looking at a culture to sort of determine where is that culture today and how are they behaving? So if you look at today's mission statement, you know, I really feel like this focuses on two things, getting taxpayers information about their tax obligations and enforcing the tax laws. And, and when I was sort of looking over this and thinking about this, I felt like that there was a real disconnect between where the IRS is at today in terms of how it's behaving and where, you know, where sort of circumstances have taken it, you know, and it may be time for the IRS to, and I think, you know, there are efforts to do this, but to really have uh, a discussion and reconciliation about what sort of organization are we and how can that be better reflected in our mission statement from the top down to you know, our interactions with taxpayers? Okay, so next, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how our current interactions with taxpayers are 
um, with specifically focusing on the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, um, previously the additional ta tax credit, now the advanced child tax credit. Um, this was mentioned previously, but the IRS has a fairly robust refund fraud program. So your return will go through, uh, will be screened and it's gonna be scored. And then if it gets a certain score, it's gonna be pulled for further analysis. So really what they're looking at is mismatches between incomes and withholdings, between what's on the return and the third party information. But there's also specific filters that look at where there's mismatch issues and the child tax credit or the EITC was, was claimed. So, you know, that is happening before the refunds already gone out. And that's to address that fraud issue because, you know, we're often, there's a lot of external pressure for the IRS to stop fraud and what it perceives, what others maybe are perceiving as, you know, taxpayers trying to um, inappropriately claim these credits. So, you know, that right there is sort of a mindset of, you know, we have to stop this money from going out the door. And I'm not, not to allude that there shouldn't be a component, but I'm just talking more broadly about what our overall, you know, sort of thought process is behind this. And, um, you know, they can even be, if, they're, if the income or withholding is verified, then they could even be referred to exam the return um, for further analysis, review of the EITC or the ACTC. So in all this time, the taxpayer is waiting for their refund. And the other challenge here is what the amount of communication and transparency to the taxpayer during this process is limited. You know, some of the notices aren't very clear. Um, and when they call the IRS, it can be different. If they can get through, it's difficult to get information about that specific issue. So, and some of that's due to our antiquated, um, outdated systems. Um, so some of that may be, you know, alleviated as, as we begin to modernize. Okay, next is something called Mather Authority. And this was, is in um, the Internal Revenue Code 6213, which the IRS usually fo follows normal deficiency procedures, which means they go through exam, you don't agree, they send you a notice, you have 90 days to go to tax court, which means you don't have to pay the tax up front, the adjusted tax up front, you can petition the tax court. Well, this provision allows them to bypass that. Um, it's called a, like what I, what we often refer to as a summary assessment. And you get 60 days from the time a notice is sent to request an abatement. And if you don't, collection can begin. And this is for mathematical and clerical errors. And it was initially for very simple things, but over the years, it's become more and more complex. And obviously from the IRS perspective, this is a very efficient way of moving things through. And EITC and CTC, ACTC is one of those things for which math error can be used for in certain circumstances. But from the taxpayer's perspective, you know, you get this notice, it's not always easy to understand, it's not clear what's being changed, and this is your interaction with the IRS. This is, you know, this is what, you know, this is the information you're getting about this refund, um, you know, that, that you most likely very much need. So next I want to talk about, you know, where the IRS is going. So you know, the IRS does do a lot of things, you know, EITC outreach and, and, and things like that. There is an effort to do these things as well. But I did want to focus on some of those things as they're, they're pretty significant programs in terms of, um, you know, making adjustments to those types of credits. But as was alluded to earlier with the Taxpayer First Act, um, you know, there was a, a report that came out that, that the IRS did that came up with proposals as to what the IRS is going to do next. And there's some really great, as was being um, discussed earlier, technological, you know, advancements in terms of, you know, callbacks and, you know, transparency with phone lines and a concierge, customer service concierge and, 
a, a, a robo chat on the on the website if you're looking for specific information. And all these things are great, but I think there's something larger we have to think about here, which is this is all how these are the modes by which taxpayers interact with the IRS. But this isn't really getting at what the interaction, once you have that interaction, what is that interaction going to feel like for the taxpayer? And how is it going to help you know, the taxpayer in this um, you know, this new environment, um, you know, retain or obtain the resources, the refunds that they, so, you know, they, they need. So, you know, let's talk about what are some other things that the IRS could do, what they could look at in terms of communicating with, with taxpayers, not just the mode, but how that communication's going to take place with taxpayers. Um, and I think this is really where we get to the cultural issue. And, you know, there's so many things that demand resources. And I think this obviously requires resources, but this really requires that cultural change, which is in some ways much more difficult to achieve in terms of sort of flipping this whole thing inside out, where we're not necessarily focusing on enforcement all the time, but we're focusing on getting taxpayers um, a, a something, a benefit that they are entitled to and working from that. And one thing that we've, there's been some studies out um, on are the notices that go out to taxpayers. And when you have that individual name on there, um, hey, set up an appointment with us, let's talk through this, you know, that has a, yields a better response we send out a million, many notices every year through correspondence audits. And when you call the IRS, if you have a question about a correspondence audit, you're many times going to get a different person each time. And you're sort of put in that position to go through everything again and have that discussion again. Whereas this is sort of um, a different approach where you're working with that one person. Also, what is the notice? What are our communications telling taxpayers and what are they trying to achieve and how are they going to achieve that? So my wife is a psychologist in the schools and she spends a lot of time working with kids and thinking about their behavior and what they call their function. And if a kid is trying to elope school you and you want to change that behavior, you look at the function of that child, which means you look, basically you're looking at the why. Why are they doing that? Are they escaping something? Is the work hard? Do they have difficulty with social interactions? And then you try to design an intervention that is going to change that, that's going to address that function and change that behavior. And, you know, I think that the IRS needs to think about what are taxpayers' functions and maybe think about it in terms of groups. You know, I mentioned on an earlier slide, I think I kind of zipped past it, but how to reach low income taxpayers, how to reach um, people with disabilities how to reach people with limited English proficiency, proficiency. Not everyone's going to have the same function, but what are they trying to get and why are they not interacting? Are they scared? Are they nervous? You know, someone mentioned earlier that there's that gotcha sort of, um, you know, sometimes people feel that the uh, communication with the IRS is a got you. Well, what if the notice was, you know, call us, we want to help you, uh, you know, get your benefits. Um, you know, as quickly as possible. You know, I think sometimes those interactions, those communications would change the taxpayer's behavior. And in fact, um, during Nina's tenure uh, as a national taxpayer advocate, there were some studies done that about sending out some uh, notices to people claiming the EITC. And this was about the relationship in the residency um, test. And we sent out notices saying, you know, hey, there was a problem going forward, you know, with this test, you know, be pay extra attention. And, you know, it showed, the research showed that the outcomes for those taxpayers who received that in those notices was better in the next two to three years than for um, their counterparts, the control group that weren't receiving that notice. So, you know, I think that the IRS, you know, there needs to be an effort 
you know, on how to change taxpayers' behavior and how to change its perception. And I think that comes from, yes, as was mentioned before, the top down. But, you know, a lot of times I think that there's so much, the IRS is a huge bureaucracy. And if we want something to trickle all the way down, there's so many layers it's got to go through until it gets to those frontline employees. So it's really a combination of things. I, in my, from my perspective, it's leadership, um, it's hiring the right people. You know, are there situations where we need social workers, um, you know, interacting with the IRS? It's the training, it's the emphasis that we're putting on things. I mean, enforcement is, you know, and always going to be an aspect, but in certain circumstances, particularly with the move towards, um, you know, these, these, um, you know, these types of programs with the advanced child tax credit, is that the emphasis? Is that where we want to uh, put our focus? And, you know, it's really a combination of things, I think, and how the IRS is going to move forward is important as the technology aspect is, I think we also have to have those discussions about changing the culture, not just changing the mode by which taxpayers get information. But once they reach that IRS person, what is that interaction gonna look like? So I think I'm gonna turn it um, back to Gabriel, who's I think we'll then turn over to Nina, who's going to set out some steps that will kind of, you know, have be thought provoking in terms of how the IRS starts to think about changing that culture and its interactions with the IRS or with the taxpayers. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, I'm mindful that uh, we may not have as much time for discussion as we hope. So I do encourage folks to put in the chat questions and thoughts about the IRS side of this. Um, and it's that way we can have some ready when Nina finishes her presentation. Um, I think Nina probably needs no introduction for this group. So I'll just turn it over. Thank you, Gabriel, and it's been great to hear everybody going ahead, and I will try not to repeat too much stuff, um, but just to go through, uh, whether the IRS recognizes it or not, as Josh was pointing out, the IRS now has a dual mission, and um, just to give some sense of the size of the work that it does, you know, it does collect $3.5 trillion in revenue, um, but it also disperses a significant amount of money in terms of benefit programs, the earned income tax credit, the premium tax credit, um, and certainly the economic impact payments. And I didn't include the child tax credit or the advanced child tax credit here, but just looking at the impact of the advanced and the refundable child tax credit by making it refundable for 2021, the Congressional Research Service projects that whereas the the previous child tax credit covered 84% of, of households with children. So it's kind of universal. It, with the advance and the refundable aspect of it, it brings it to 96%. So it is a universal child credit. And that really goes to something that David said about you know having the universality means that the, peop, the employees working on it can see themselves in the program. And then of course, the impact on child poverty. And in one of our earlier sessions, we had a slide, and I can't remember from whom it was, but showing that EITC and the child tax credit combined outstrip all other federal, you know, individual federal benefit programs for children. So the two of those programs, which are run through the code, are at the top of benefits being dispersed for the benefits of children. So the mission has creeped over the years to the point that the IRS is running benefit programs. Um, and not just collecting revenue. Now, the current, you know, the thing about the mission statement is that I first recommended in the 2010 annual report to Congress from the National Taxpayer Advocate, I made it a most serious problem of taxpayers that the IRS needed to change its mission statement to reflect its dual mission of of at basically administering a benefits program. And just by way of background, in in 1998 in the last major restructuring um, legislation before the Taxpayer First Act, Congress actually required the IRS to reorganize and also required it to, quote, review and restate its mission to place a, govern a greater emphasis on serving the public and meeting taxpayers' needs. 
And the legislative history on the Senate Finance Committee side to that act said, the Senate Finance Committee believes that taxpayer service is of such importance that the committee should mandate that a key part of the IRS mission must be taxpayer service. So this is the current IRS mission statement, provide America's taxpayers top quality service. So there you see the recognition of, of service by helping them understand and meet their tax responsibilities and enforce the law with integrity and fairness to all. Now, interestingly, the mission that was adopted by the IRS in response to RA 98 actually said, and apply the law with integrity and fairness to all. And this mission statement went through meeting with employees, working, you know, coming up with language, sharing it with the public. Um, in the dead of night, several years after the mission statement saying apply the law um, was adopted, the IRS commissioner and his senior group of people around him change that word from apply to enforce. And they just did it on a print run of you know some document that had the mission statement on it. And that's been the mission statement from that point on. And so it shows you that even when Congress is trying to get the IRS and mandating that the IRS change its focus, the culture of the IRS seeps back in and changes the world from apply, which is neutral and doesn't talk about force, to enforce and shows its you know, shows its enforcement mentality. Well, now you have, you know, the Taxpayer First Act mandating the IRS to create a customer's comprehensive customer service strategy, et cetera. And I really think that what the IRS needs to do is mandate the IRS again to revise its mission statement to reflect this dual mission. And you can see that here is my stab at that mission statement that you explicitly recognize that you, that you part of your job is to help them not only meet understand and meet their tax responsibilities but also receive the tax benefits for which they are eligible and going back to and by applying the law with lo integrity and fairness to all and now that we have a taxpayer bill of rights let us acknowledge in her mission that our, that what the congress has said in the law, which is that your job is to ensure that taxpayer rights are adhered to. So that's sort of my mission statement. Now, why would we want to focus on a mission statement? So to me, the most important thing is, and I've talked about, you know, all of these components here, that, you know, the agency's organizational culture reflects the agency's mission, but most importantly, something that David talked about in performance, you know, executive performance agreements, but the mission statement, you know, every agency does a budget proposal every single year and periodically, and it's usually every five years, they create a strategic plan. And the mission statement, basically from that mission statement flows the agency's goals, their objectives, their strategies, their initiatives, their performance measures, how they're measuring how they're doing, what measures they, what goals they set for their executives in the performance agreements. It is infected into these job descriptions of the employees and it's infected into the hiring plans. Are you going to infect, are you going to hire more enforcement employees? Are you going to hire call center people? Are you going to use contractors to answer the phones? Um, and so, you know, it's all in the agency mission. So, you know, one possible one thing, if you have a mission statement that focuses on, you know, delivering the benefits to eligible persons, you're going to start seeing the participation rate showing up in performance measures. You're going to see that the primary focus isn't the improper payment rate of these benefits, but rather that you're getting the highest participation rate you can for eligible taxpayers while protecting taxpayer rights and minimizing undue burdens. You'll start seeing that, and to, in order to get that participation rate, you'll have to understand the characteristics of the taxpayer population, and you'll start thinking of creative ways and partnerships that you can do to get them, to get that participation. And I think, you know, to Saran's point, you'll start designing systems that that actually are designed for the taxpayer population that you are approaching rather than trying to force the taxpayer population into the systems that you design and that work for you. All right, here is the IRS, the Wage and Investment Operating Division, current organizational structure. I know this is hard to read, but it would be very hard for you to find earned income credit or child tax credit anywhere in this design. It is nowhere. 
Now, where it might be, I'll take my little thing, this unit here, RICS, Return Integrity Compliance Services. RICS is all about refund and return integrity. It's all about fraud detection. Way down here is the Refundable Credits Program Management, which does have a mission of thinking about how to get some, you know, get the credits out to eligible taxpayers, but it also its job is to protect credits from going away from taxpayers. You have here the, the refundable credits examination function. Um, this is the program that has what Josh was talking about, I, you know, the taxpayer protection program, the pre-refund wage verification program, um, and then, of course, you know, EITC exam. Way over here is field assistance con contrasted to Social Security with 1,200 field offices. The IRS has less than 400 around the nation, even though it affects many more taxpayers than Social Security does um, on an annual basis. Here is SPEC under, you know, that's that deals with um, is supposed to do outreach and education. It has, last time I checked, about 400 employees out of the 40,000 employees or so in wage and investment. Um, that tells you the, the um, emphasis that the IRS puts on outreach and education. And SPEC, of course, also is over the Vitasite program, which you don't even see on this map. So I think, you know, um, this tells you a little something about where you know, folks are buried. There's communication and liaison up here, and then there's also headquarter communication. Um, I think over here under strategies and solutions might be research, but it's not under the program that might be dealing with the group of taxpayers that we're most concerned about. So, um, you know, again, we've all been talking about how do you affect culture, you know, in the IRS. And I think this is something that Gabriel has been trying to emphasize is, you know, one, it begins with leadership. Um, and I think David has said, you know, giving the example of Mr. Ball, just how you can set the tone by really emphasizing what your mission is and what your purpose is in being in a job. Um, you will all, I think Congress also sets it, you know, RA 98 certainly made an effort. You've got some language in the Taxpayer First Act. Um, and then, you know, the, annually the appropriation committees give directions to the IRS. They directed the IRS several years, about a, in 2002, I think, might have been a little bit later to create a taxpayer assistance blueprint because they weren't happy with what the IRS was doing. And for several years, that exercise actually made the IRS really focus on how it was delivering things to taxpayers. Unfortunately, the enforcement, you know, emphasis crept back in, and um, that that process of reviewing your taxpayer assistance blueprint ultimately diluted the blueprint. So it also takes constant focus on this, which again goes back to leadership and congressional oversight. And I think also White House and Treasury have a role to this. And then finally, I think taxpayers and stakeholders have to demand it. They have to say, this is not working. They need to call their congressional representatives to say this isn't working. And I think, you know, instances like, you know, efforts like Code for America showing what can be done um, raises the bar for the IRS. You know, now what's historically happened is the IRS says, you know, well, they're doing it, so it's great. So we're so proud of our partners and we're going to take credit for what our partners did when in fact it's the partners that did it. This is what's happened in the context of tax return preparation. You would think that a culture, an organization that has a culture of wanting to hear from taxpayers and learn what experiences that they're having would really want to do return preparation itself in its walk-in sites. And it would find avenues in order to be able to get them to do this tax return preparation. It's a great way to learn about how taxpayers are experiencing problems. But the IRS in 2014 stopped preparing returns in its walk-in sites. And it turned to the VITA sites to do that work. And now the IRS claims credit for the work that the VITA sites are doing. 
What's really important about IRS employees preparing returns and IRS employees facing taxpayers in an in-person environment is that they have to learn, they learn what taxpayers are experiencing instead of being able to treat them as some distant object they actually see that these are taxpayers coming in, even if they've done something wrong, they need help and they want to get help. And that changes how you think about taxpayers. And it also means that the leadership has to change how they think about taxpayers. So here is my 12 step program for culture change at the IRS. And some of it I've talked about before. You know, first of all, you adopt a mission statement like I've suggested. Second, you establish performance measures that really look at things that affect taxpayers and you hold executives accountable. You can establish numeric goals at an organization level. Now, one of the things that came in with RA 98 because of the focus, the enforcement focus of the IRS is it's prevented from at an individual level or even at an, you know, an organizational level using what we call records of tax enforcement results or rotors. So you can't evaluate an employee on the number of dollars they collect or the number of levies they collect. You can't even evaluate an employee on the number of EITC dollars that in their phone calls or in the returns that they might have prepared, they, they got out to taxpayers. But what you can do is you can set goals for the unit and and for the executives in the unit, you know, that the unit has a goal of increasing the EITC participation rate, you know, by X amount or by increasing the participation rate in the advanced child tax credit of non-filers by X amount. And then that goal will, then you have a strategy to get that through your organization so people develop initiatives and things in order to achieve that. So how would you really be able to get that culture change? This is something I've talked about a lot. You create a dedicated unit. Forget about all that, that RICS stuff. RICS needs to exist. It's return integrity. It's refund fraud detection, identity theft detection. But you create a dedicated unit, the family and worker benefit unit, that is responsible for all aspects of delivering tax benefits to families and workers. And that includes taxpayer education, assistance, outreach, and compliance initiatives. And one of the benefits of this is that you then start having a unit that starts thinking about using technology and the data that you have, not just for the purpose of identifying fraud or compliance risk, but using data to to, in order to identify taxpayers who might be eligible for benefits. So something that Gabriel and I have really been pushing is, you know, identifying taxpayers who are eligible for the childless worker earned income credit because we have the W-2 information and reaching out to them and even using the authority you have in the code to actually provide them a refund after the return has been filed and you haven't seen that claim. Um, you know, that FABU would contain a dedicated year-round toll-free assistance line that goes to something that, you know, Fan has talked about, 365-day toll-free assistance line. Why not have a helpline where people can call up during the year to say, I have a question, would I be eligible for this advanced child tax credit? Would I be eligible for all of these provisions? A answer them in advance. Do it in an anonymous way if you want to. And also that line would also be able to help with the, um, if we have the advanced child tax credit, that program would contain the dispute resolution program as well. Right now, the IRS's front door is staffed by contractors. All they can do is answer FAQs. They can't do anything else. So for most taxpayers, they have to be gated somewhere else or they don't get their question answered. I am saying, don't do that. You know, have your trained professional employees, and that goes to point five, hire and staff your employees so that they have expertise in social welfare programs and they are, have experience with dealing with the beneficiaries of the programs and the characteristics that they have. 
And then the other thing that you need to do, because returns will be stopped, part of the problem with getting benefits out to people is, and even just their refunds, is that their refunds are frozen until the IRS, that the return goes through all those processes that Josh showed on his slide and we talked about in our very first session of this workshop series. And so if the IRS doesn't adequately staff those programs in order to get to those returns quickly and weed out the ones that are false positives, there's nothing nothing wrong with that return. They can go back into the system and be processed. You know, you need to set a goal. You need to staff so that you can get through all these frozen things by no later than January 1st of each filing season. So the taxpayers can get their refunds quickly and they can get their advanced child tax credit at least for the second half of the year. Now, this goes to the simplified filing portal, not just for the advanced child tax credit, but for people to get earned income credit. Um, develop, and this goes to my, the next point is developing programs and algorithms for identifying and automatically determining eligibility, et cetera. Now, go to geographically based outreach and education. Have people insights, pick up David's suggestion that the IRS partner with Social Security, that the IRS go to post offices. They desperately need, you know, revenue, to, you know, to rent space, use space um, in these other places. A proposal I've made for years is that the IRS should be buying vans so that it can send its employees out to rural communities and on Wednesday, you know, the van will be in the parking lot of this public library and taxpayers can come in and see, um, you know, and meet with an IRS people. The, the stakeholders can be there too. It can be Wednesday at the parking lot of the, you know, public library will be a way for people to get all sorts of stuff addressed and the IRS will be there and can enroll you in all sorts of things. Um, and then enrollment would also include working with your state agencies. So if you're signing up for SNAP, you know, then you can sign up for the child tax credit and the data can go to the IRS um, about who had who is receiving benefits and that can be used so that you don't have false positives as you're doing these refund screens. Um, I want to jump real and then I've mentioned the navigator program. I want to jump to my last recommendation, which I think is incredibly important. The IRS has some federal advisory committees under the Federal Advisory Committee Act um, that are, you know, dealing with um, taxpayer service are dealing with general, um, there, there's an advisory committee made of tax professionals, there's an advisory committee for electronic tax administration. We need a federal advisory committee for family and worker benefits units. And the membership on that would be from external advocates like low income taxpayer clinics and um, stakeholders like Vita sites or, or groups like you know, the, the groups that are trying to help people get the, the NGOs that are trying to help people get the child tax credit so that they can advise the IRS on the administration of this program. And it would be a treasury advisory committee and they would be giving an annual report to the treasury secretary and the commissioner on issues and recommendations that they have. So kind of to wind up the 13th step is due process and dispute resolution. And we had a panel on due process, but I just wanted to take some elements here of some you know, due process litigation. Now, Goldberg v. Kelly is a very important case. It has since been diluted or narrowed, I would say, by later um, discussion, but it still provides an analytical tool for deciding how you would design a dispute resolution process. And so the first thing is, you need to have timely and adequate notice. And as Josh said, the math error notices, which you know there were 5 million of them that went out last year about just the rebate recovery credit and the EIPs alone, they are not informative at all. They do not tell the taxpayer what line on the return was changed. They do not tell the taxpayer, you know, they do not emphasize the fact that if you dispute this, you can get you call by within 60 days and get access to the tax court as well. 
Um, so a lot needs to be done for that. And certainly a lot needs to be done on some of these tools the IRS has, where you're being told that your return, your e-filed return is rejected, but you're not told why it's rejected and what your options are. Code for America has really addressed this in its tool, but it's not in the IRS tools. Um, and then you need, you know, if you are going to go through a dispute, the dispute resolution really has to give people an opportunity to present their evidence orally. And, and this was key language from Goldberg v. Kelly, tailor the opportunity to be heard to the capacities and circumstances of those who are to be heard. So if you understand your taxpayer population who's receiving these benefits, which the FABU would understand, then your hearings would be designed in such a way that they could avail themselves, you know, really participate in the hearing. And it doesn't just have to be in person. You know, we know from research that if you set an appointment, people show up rather than just calling up randomly. You can establish an appointment and by creating an app that allows people to dial in on their smartphones, they could have a virtual, you know, hearing. They could hold their documentation up to a camera and a picture could be taken of it. You know, there could be a lot of things that could be done that could work with this population that would be helpful. And the most helpful thing would be, which is not the case now, when you are assigning someone to do a compliance contact, then that person owns that case from start to finish. Right now, in the correspondence exams, which constitute about 75% of all IRS audits of individuals, no one employee owns that case. You could get any individual at any time if you called to talk about your case. So signing one person to work with that person, with that taxpayer, when there is a compliance issue, there is an audit, is vital. And then finally, access to representation. Now, we'll be sending out the slides later, but, you know, these are a whole series of um, procedurally taxing blogs. You can go to procedurally taxing and just put in advanced child tax credit and you'll get a whole bunch of posts that we've talked through how to do these things. And that's it. I'll stop my share now. Thank you, Nina. Um, well, we have 15 minutes. I want to open up for conversation. So let's, I do see there's been a, uh, there's been some action in the chat. Um, Patrick, I wanted to open up the floor if you want to elaborate on any of the conversation that was happening here for the benefit of the fuller group. Um, and then anyone else, feel free to message questions, feel free to do the hand raise thing. And if not, I'll also ask my own questions. So please, uh, please send in yours. But Patrick, anything you want to elaborate on from the chat? Uh, <clears throat> no, just about tiering and scaling. I mean, I think that uh, um, Nina's uh, point about getting approximate to people and getting that, you know, that high quality assistance is just so exciting. Um, and so obviously there's multiple ways where it can be designed. I think by beginning with that base of really high quality folks, you know, not just folks that um, it, just getting that um, as close to the ground as possible really does kind of drive up things. I know that there were some other questions and I'm probably not good at uh, scrolling back through it to, to, to find out which ones were there. Yeah, that was I the know idea. the reconciliation process was brought up as well too. Got it. I will, I will scroll back up for that. Uh, in the meantime, I'll, in the absence of other questions, but please send them as you have them, I'll pose a question to Nina as a next step here. Um, but Nina on the spot a bit. Um, about, uh, you know, we got a lot of different people on the phone representing outside organizations, representing government. Um, how much of these items that you're outlining are congressional items and how much can be pushed forward otherwise? And uh, what kind of actions do you think folks can be taking to help uh, advance some of these? And which ones are, are most eminently achievable versus maybe a little more challenging if we can't get stuff into the Build Back Better bill or some other um, similar legislation? Well, I do, you know, I mean, obviously always appropriations are important, resources are important, but, and, but I do think that the IRS could tomorrow start creating a family and worker benefit unit. That's just organization. You know, my concern is that you would then move people from the existing IRS instead of getting the um, resources from outside and hiring basically new staff. And that to me is key that you need to hire staff that you then train in the way that David was talking about in the very beginning. Um, 
and you know, in his presentation, so that they really understand the purpose of their job. And you have to redo the position descriptions, but all of that is administrative. The IRS can do that starting tomorrow. The fall, the the advisory committee, the IRS can reach out to Treasury. It would be a Treasury advisory committee, but that statute already exists. You know, the FACA already exists. So you could create that tomorrow and getting that on up and running would really help the IRS move along because it would be a, a legal transparent mechanism for getting the, inner, the, the experience and recommendations from the stakeholders, the external stakeholders who are on the ground representing folks, you know, or advocating for folks. Um, I do think that the IRS will need more it needs a direction from Congress and Congress tried to give them that direction in the Taxpayer First Act. And I have not been impressed by the products that I've seen from the Taxpayer First Act. I think there's some thinking there, but I think that it's more, it's not the kind of transformative thing that you, I think Congress hoped to see out of that direction to re you know, to modernize the IRS. Um, I think Congress is going to have to give the IRS funding for, you know, really making a physical presence. And that includes not just really staffing the 400 walk-in sites that it has, but looking at those innovative other ways of getting out to the community. And it's not just that the IRS itself has to do all that work, but if it's out in the community, then it's really working with the stakeholders who are also doing that work. And it's on the ground and it hears from the taxpayers. And that's going to take, you know, I think a congressional directive, and it's going to take some staffing that says in the appropriation bill, this is what you need to do. And I really like David's idea about how, you know, the Social Security is reimbursed you know, for doing certain applications. And to me, that's a great idea. If, if you know, we could, we could either reimburse others to do our, to do applicate, you know, to do enrollment in the advanced child tax credit, other agencies, if they're already doing some kind of enrollment process, but it takes really, it takes creative thinking, not just going back to what you're doing. Thanks, Nina. Um, I do see a question in the chat from Melanie, so maybe, <laughs> uh, I know Nina will have strong feelings about this one. I'll pose this to anyone who wants to jump in about the use of the word taxpayer uh, versus the word people or resident or, or any other yeah. word you might want to use in the mission statement or elsewhere. Um, and I'm curious to hear folks' thoughts on the relative merits of each of those and, and where we should be leaning, especially in the context of the CDC, where a lot of people have been turned off by hearing the word tax and thinking, oh, that's not me. I'm not a taxpayer. Yeah. I think that's really valid. I mean, especially since you've now got the refundable child tax credit, which is bringing in people who aren't taxpayers. I mean, they're not taxpayers. They're not paying tax. So I, you know, I like that. Yeah, and, noted. and I can mention that's something that we, um, while I was in the IRS and online services, we were struggling with too, because there are a lot of people that we're serving that are not traditional taxpayers by the definition of it. And so we, we used... Um, different terms, including people, and just calling it a customer service strategy, just uh, looking at it like we were providing the service to our customers and making sure that we were um, approaching it that way. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely interested to see where that would, would head. I would say, though, that, you know, we can't forget, and, and this is something that that is really important, we can't forget that the IRS deals with a lot of people on a lot of other issues. And so it does have the job of applying the tax laws to taxpayers. So that's, that's a little bit hard to um, get that out of a mission statement for a, ta a tax agency. You know, I know you had mentioned at some point some research around the use of the word taxpayer and certain like identities that solicited when it was used, not to put you on the spot, can you speak to that at all? Um, do, yeah, you know what I, I don't remember. Actually, I don't remember what. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will go figure out what I'm talking about before I ask yeah. you about it in front of uh, 50 people. <laughs> um, please do keep submitting questions, but in the meantime, I'll just keep coming on my own. Um, maybe I will. I will uh, turn to Josh, who is uh, you know in his role currently uh, in the IRS, or at least closest uh, to, to the parts of the IRS we're talking about. Um, 
Josh, not to put you on the spot, but you know, if you have reflections on the, of the various items Nina is putting forward, you know, which ones you could imagine most immediately kind of impacting how some of this work is done and, and you know, some of your reflections on that. Well, I think that a couple things that Nina said, which is that I, I wanted to comment on, which is, you know, I think when I think of the accessibility part, or I think of the online service part, I think of the customer service part, uh, to me, that's not so much a culture issue. That's making sure when a taxpayer needs to get in touch with the IRS, there's the easiest possible way they can do it. When they need to get information to the IRS, it's done in the easiest possible way they can. And I, I think that, you know, if it's on your phone and you just have to hit a button or submit a question, then that gets people interacting, that gets taxpayers interacting. Otherwise, if you're calling and sitting on hold for three hours and you go to the website and you can't find the information and you go to where's my refund and it gives you, it's been saying for the last six months that your return's being processed and you can't get on your online account because you can't authenticate, you give up. I mean, you give up. So I think that's the first thing is making sure they get have the easiest path, least resistance. And then when they get to the IRS, I think having that person on the other end that is viewing them as, as, a, as someone that needs assistance and wants to help them get there, hey, I'm going to help you get from here to there. And that's a key component. And then I think finally, to Nina's point, I think a lot of these things can be done fairly quickly because changing culture as great as you know um, technology is, and yes, we need resources to do it, but changing culture, changing be behavior can really be done in so many ways that the IRS can start doing tomorrow, you know? And I so I just I really think that these a lot of these things like the mission statement um you know in training and things like that can be done very quickly and i and i do think that sometimes there's a huge disconnect between irs leadership and the people on the front line and i think you know really providing that training and reinforcing that culture change is a huge part of it so those are sort of my observations thanks josh um I want to connect this to something uh, David said that caught my eye uh, in his presentation um, about social security at times turning to social media and forgetting the basics, forgetting the phone and phone and mail uh, to chase, I guess, maybe shinier objects. I thought that was an interesting point because there's, there's obviously a lot of thought of like agencies trying to be more modern with how they interface with people and using the new tools. I'm wondering if there's more detail in terms of like, you know, the, the cautionary tale of trying to do too much to find some new ways to talk to people and forgetting what the important ones are. Um, if there's anybody telling that. Yeah, I'll say, um, yeah, well, I'll say a, a little bit more about that. So um, one of the things I think that happens with, uh, you're right, it's the new shiny object, but it's also true that when the administration wants to do something that is a uh, presidential administration, it'll ask agencies to do outreach or communication. And the thing about social media is it's so easy to do. They can post something on Facebook or Twitter and say they did it. They can report back they did it. But it's... Um, what we found particularly um, with some of the problems in the um, SSI program where we have a participation problem just like you do in other programs, Not there are plenty of people who are eligible who don't get it. And so one of the things they, the Senate kind of emphasized to the agency and the advocates and others emphasize is sometimes SSA knows people who are potentially eligible for SSI. It's not that complicated, send them a letter. <laughs> um, it's, um, it won't solve the entire problem, but it's a very straightforward way. And it's it'll directly reach people as opposed to putting something on Twitter um, or Facebook. So that was a little bit of what I was trying to think about there. You know, that goes to, I mean, I sort of went that really through that really quickly, but that goes to the, the issue of, you know, the IRS has so much data and it's now getting, you know, from social security daily, you know, the W-2 information. And it now has, and the, the due date has been moved up from the employers to January 31st. And you've also got a mandate coming, you know, really lowering when the threshold by which, you know, employers have to file W-2s electronically. So each step along the way, by the end of the filing season, you pretty much have 
the vast majority of all the W-2s. And you're st- now that they've separated out non-employee compensation on a different form, you're getting really the two major pieces of information that you need to know about earnings, at least, you know, in order to be able to say somebody either hasn't filed or somebody has filed a return and they haven't claimed the childless worker EITC. And I focus on that because that's just a lookup table, right? Here's your income. Here's the amount you get. You don't have to deal with children. So at the after April 15th, just look at the returns coming in. Look at the W-2s and 1099 miscellaneous NECs and say, oh, we've got some people who haven't claimed this, which is now really expanded, right, you know, for 2021. So this filing season, 2022, the IRS could do that on May 1st, May 15th. And sure, they could send out a letter saying this, but really, if they have an account with that return, like the person's already gotten a refund, then why not give them that money and send them the letter saying, hi, we did this. You want to talk about changing perceptions of the IRS. That's what a benefits administrator should do. You know, be proactive in that way and not just use data to stop a refund because the the earnings don't, that the taxpayers reporting doesn't match the employer's earnings reported, but use the data also to get the benefits out. And until the IRS makes that its focus, you will have the response that I used to get when I would go to the IRS leadership, the commissioner on down, and I can't tell you how many conversations I had this exact conversation with several commissioners saying, look at the false positive rates that the IRS has on its fraud detection. There were some filters that had a 93% false positive rate, meaning that once the IRS looked at the returns that that filter had stopped, 93% of the returns were actually legitimate. So you stop those returns and you don't have the staffing to look at them. And, you know, four months later, the taxpayer still hasn't gotten their refund. And what I suggested was, as you've got goals to stop refund fraud, you should have a goal of and a you know a performance measure of stop reducing the false positive rate. And actually, I didn't even say it was a measure. It should be an indicator just to show how you're doing, that you track it. And the response from the commissioner and the deputy commissioner, each one of them said to me that they couldn't do that because that would send a message to the employees that they should let fraud go by and not pay as much attention to fraud. David's head is sinking. (laughs) That's the response. That needs a cultural change from the top, that it's perfectly, you can measure, you know, false positive instead of goals saying we want to get it below 93%. And you won't be throwing out billions of dollars, but that's the risk averse thing that Saran's been talking about. That's the culture of the IRS that needs to change. And I think that um, really quick, we saw an example of the Nina's point about the data recently with the IRS getting out economic impact payments and you know having to work to get data on um, SSI beneficiaries. And you know what if they would have you know, had that information already and how could they use that information in the future? Because that is a, you know, a target group of people that that's it because I think, you know, as mentioned previously, that's a needs-based program, Um, you know, and, you know, if you had that information, that's an example. If we had that information on hand, we could leverage that information to get these resources out to individuals. So I, you know, when you, you were talking about that, Nina, it just made me think of that recent example in terms of not having the SSI data and having to work to get that. Yeah. Well, Gabriel, I think we're at an end. We're at noon. Um, This is the, um, I want to thank everybody, um, our esteemed moderator and our wonderful panelists for a great panel. Um, I guess I'm thanking myself. Um, But anyway, Um, Our next panel is going to actually say is really about where do we go from here, okay? This is the last panel in our workshop next Monday, and we will have some great panelists to talk about different aspects 
of proposals for change, um, not just cultural change, but all sorts of types of change, legislative, et cetera. And maybe by then we'll have a piece of legislation. Um, who knows? But thank you all very much. We'll be posting this video. We will be posting the slides for all of the workshops. Um, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, go to our website, taxpayer-rights.org and subscribe to our newsletter so you'll find out about future workshop series that we're doing. Thank you all. I really appreciate you being here. Yay.